Expansion in the 18th Century Colonial Wars. These could be considered part of the Second Hundred Years' War between 1689 and 1815. These colonial wars will involve most European nations and will show you how balance of power politics determines why nations go to war. Background. Britain and France were the two main adversaries in these colonial wars for empire in this time period. Britain and France, remember, had had a hate-hate relationship for centuries. Between 1689 and 1783, both countries engaged in a series of wars over the issue of maritime trade and colonial expansion. France had the largest army on land and was working to build up its naval forces. France sought support to support Spain once they took control over the Spanish crown when Louis XIV's grandson was allowed to ascend to the throne there. The Second Hundred Years' War visual graphic, France versus England. You can include all of these wars, the wars of Louis XIV, including the War of the League of Augsburg, the War of Spanish Succession, the War of Austrian Succession that we'll talk about here, the Seven Years' War, which we'll talk about, of course, the American Revolution, the War of the First Coalition, and the Napoleonic Wars, all of which we will discuss in uh, this unit and in coming units. The War of Spanish Succession, 1701 to 1713, was actually one where France and England were also involved. What's the background? Okay. The prospect of the Bourbons, remember Louis XIV and his grandson, controlling both France and Spain and their empires, became a major threat to Britain in North America and the balance of power in Europe. We talked about the War of Spanish Succession as one of the wars of Louis in an earlier unit. Britain's American colonies along the East Coast would be surrounded by what was called New France in the North and Spanish territory in Florida and in the West. Eventually, the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 ended this war. France lost Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and the Hudson Bay territory in North America to Great Britain. Spain lost the Asiento to Britain. The West African slave trade with the New World was what the Asiento was. Spain agreed to allow one British ship of merchandise per year through Panama as well. This was Britain's attempt to crack open the Spanish colonial market to British goods. There's another war, the War of Jenkins' Ear, which began in 1739. I know that's a crazy title to a war, but let me explain what it's all about. It started over the issue of Spain's allegation of British abuse regarding the Treaty of Utrecht's provision that allowed Britain to send that one ship of merchandise to Central America, or Panama, per year. Spanish officials boarded a British ship suspected of smuggling goods into Latin America without you know, beyond that one ship, and they cut off the ear of the British Captain Jenkins. His, he kept his ear in a jar of brandy and presented it to Parliament seven years later. In response, King George II went to war with Spain. That's why it's called the War of Jenkins' Ear, crazily enough. The conflict expanded eventually into the War of Austrian Succession in 1740. And this is when France and Austria and Prussia and Russia also eventually get involved. The War of Austrian Succession, 1740 to 1748. 
It involved battles between England and France in North America and India. Spain fought effectively in keeping its empire intact. It ended with the Treaty of a la Chapelle, 1748, which essentially kept the status quo in the colonial empires. The War of Austrian Succession ultimately began when Prussia challenged Maria Theresa of Austria ascending to the throne. Basically, Prussia was not recognizing the pragmatic sanction that uh, Maria Theresa's father, Charles VII, had tried to get um, uh, the other countries of Europe to sign off on allowing her to ascend the throne, even though she was a woman. We'll talk more about that later. Anyhow, this will eventually uh, lead to yet another war, the Seven Years' War. And this is the one that's kind of crazy because it really goes on for longer than seven years. Uh, part of the Seven Years' War is actually fought in North America between the French and the English, and it's known as the French and Indian War. And of course, that French and Indian War is a precursor to um, tensions that will result between the American colonists and eventually the British overlords and will uh, escalate into the American Revolution. We will make all of those connections, don't you worry. The Seven Years' War was the biggest world war of the 18th century. It began in the disputed Ohio Valley of North America when a young American officer, George Washington, engaged a French force protecting Fort Duquesne in modern-day Pittsburgh. This started in 1754. This is the North American phase of the Seven Years' War. French forces and their Amer Indian allies or Native American allies fought British and American colonial forces ultimately for control of North America. The Seven Years War will have uh, different fronts. This is the North American front of the Seven Years War, the French and Indian War. This war became part of the larger Seven Years' War being fought in Europe as well as in India. William Pitt was Britain's new Prime Minister. He changed Britain's war strategy in the middle of the war by focusing more attention on the North American front, the French and Indian War, as opposed to the European front of the Seven Years' War. Britain's Navy defeated France's Navy in various engagements on the high seas, ultimately turning the tide in the favor of the British. France planned to invade Great Britain, but its devastating naval losses ended such an attempt. British trade prospered as a result. France's trade dropped to one sixteenth of its pre-war level, and that will devastate the French economy, not to mention the loss of territories in North America to the British. France's sugar trade with its West Indian colonies was choked off. Britain took control of French posts near Calcutta and Madras in India as well, gaining a foothold for a future empire for Great Britain in that region. When Spain entered the war on France's side, Great Britain seized Cuba and the Philippines from Spain. This will result eventually in the Treaty of Paris, 1763. This is the first of the treaties of Paris we will discuss. Unfortunately, folks, there are several different treaties called the Treaty of Paris. That, so it's important that you recognize the year so you know which war it ended. The Treaty of Paris 1763 ends the Seven Years War in Europe as well as the parts of the Seven Years War that were fought in India between Britain and France and in North America between Great Britain, France, and Spain. 
the French and Indian War was what that one is, by the way. Um, this was the most important peace treaty since the Treaty of Westphalia that was signed in 1648. France was removed from North America. Not completely, but almost. France accepted British domination of India as well. Spain ceded Florida to Britain in return for Cuba and the Philippines. By the way, France still maintained control over the Louisiana territories. So when we say they were removed from North America, they were removed from the parts of North America that England was wanting to spread into at that point in time. Great Britain thus became the world's dominant colonial power. Here are territorial changes following the French and Indian War. Land held by the British before 1763 is shown in red. Land gained by Britain in 1763 is shown in pink. It's a huge amount of territory that they gained. But the Louisiana territories will still be part of French and Spanish territories. The American Revolution will be a byproduct of the French and Indian War, which was part of the Seven Years' War. Now, since this is a European history class, we're not going to get into all the nitty gritty about it. But just so you all know, the American colonists, of course, were British citizens. They had fought with the British soldiers against the French and the Indian forces in North America. After the victory, of Great Britain over France in the French and Indian War. The British government decided in order to pay for the costs of the war, which were very expensive, they would um, designate new and special taxes specifically just on the American colonists. The colonists saw this as infringing upon their natural rights. They had no representation in Parliament like other British citizens, yet they were being taxed these taxes, and these taxes were not on other British citizens. They saw this as being taxed without representation and ultimately going against their natural rights. There would be other issues as well that you will learn more about next year in American history. But suffice it to say, once the British were having to fight against the American colonists to try to maintain control over their North American territories, then the French, who had just lost to Great Britain in the French and Indian War and Seven Years' War, the whole thing, decided that they would support the American colonists to try to get back at Great Britain and perhaps get some of their territories back in North America. Okay, so in hopes of weakening Britain's world empire, France gave significant financial and military support to the American colonists and their successful war for independence. Now think about this, folks. France has an absolute monarchy under Louis XVI at the time. They do not care about the ideals of the American revolutionaries those enlightenment ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They, however, do care about trying to hurt Great Britain and perhaps gain some of their territories that they had just lost back. The 13 American colonies have been Britain's most valuable colonial possessions as both a source of raw materials and a large market for British goods. By 1775, about two and a half million people lived in the colonies. That's over 1.6 million from England alone. Key concept. The Netherlands will take control over Indonesia. By the way, we'll talk more specifically about the American Revolution. Um, when we start talking about the French Revolution and how the connection can be made between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. So to be continued on that. What I have just said is um, sufficient for this unit. The Netherlands took control of Indonesia. 
the Dutch East India Company dominated the spice trade in Indonesia. The East Indies is what it was known as throughout the 18th century. Corruption and mismanagement of the Dutch East India Company led to it being dissolved by the Dutch government in 1800, and Indonesia became nationalized by the Dutch Republic as a result. What about wars in colonial Latin America? Spain, first of all. In the 18th century, Spain's colonies remained an important part of the Atlantic economy. Silver mining recovered in Mexico and Peru. The Spanish Empire recovered under Philip V, who was Louis XIV's grandson, who was able to ascend the throne after the War of Spanish Succession. They had the third most powerful navy in the world behind Great Britain and France. After 1713, when the War of Spanish Succession was over, Spain improved its control over their empire, mostly because they had a bourbon on the throne. Enlightened despotism of Charles III, later on, also expanded economic and administrative reforms. Creoles were Spaniards born in Latin America, and they came to rival the power of the Spanish authorities there. They strove to recreate a European-style aristocracy in Latin America. Some were wealthy class merchants who benefited from smuggling activities. American Indians were shifted from forced labor to debt peonage on owner's lands, or debt slavery, if you will. They accounted for, the Creoles accounted for about 20% of the American or Latin American population. Mestizos in Latin America were children born to Spanish fathers and Indian mothers. Eventually, they represented about 30% of the population and they are a rung below the Creoles. The American Indian population constituted about 70% of the population. Landowners believed American Indians should do the hard labor in the countryside. Black slavery remained in the sugar plantations of Cuba and Puerto Rico. Portuguese Brazil. Sugar plantations in Brazil required massive numbers of slaves. By the early 19th century, half of Brazil's population was of African descent. The Portuguese Indian and African populations in Brazil intermixed socially to a greater degree than in the Spanish Empire, resulting in a multicolor population. Key concept. The expansion of Europe, commerce accelerated the growth of a worldwide economic network. Key concepts. Key concept, agricultural revolution raised productivity and increased the supply of food and other agricultural products. The agricultural revolution, 17th and 18th centuries. The state of agriculture in 1700, first of all. Peasants and artisans had about the same standard of living as they had had throughout the Middle Ages. Most people battled hunger and lacked sufficient clothing and decent housing. Agriculture had changed little since the Middle Ages. 80% of Western Europe's population were farmers. The percentage was even higher in Eastern Europe. Net the Netherlands were the only exception where they had a more urban and mercantile environment and society. Agricultural output was very low compared to modern standards. The medieval open field system was still predominant. Failed harvests occurred once or twice a decade on average, resulting in famines that were regular. People were malnourished, making them more susceptible to diseases. Science was essentially a branch of theology, 
even after the scientific revolution that we just discussed and really had no real application in agriculture up to this point. That is going to change. Subsistence agriculture, that means agriculture that is for folks who are just trying to plant and grow as much as they can live off of, and the open field system. Subsistence agriculture, like I said, farming for the purpose of survival, not for selling food commercially as a business. Most farming on common lands was done for subsistence purposes for the village. This is how it had been throughout the medieval period. Common lands were open and strips of land for agriculture were not divided by fences or hedges. These were the open common lands, pasture lands that had been around since the medieval manor that you learned about in ninth grade. Open fields were farmed as a community. Agriculture in villages changed little from generation to generation. It was based largely on community and family traditions. The exhaustion of the soil was a common problem. Planting the same thing over and over again uh, reduces the amount of nutrients in the soil that are possible, that are there from year to year. Wears it out. Eventually, one third to half of the lands were allowed to lie fallow on any given year so that the soil could recover. This, the third uh, portion was when the three field system was introduced. This was known as the three crop field rotation or the three field system in northern Europe and the two crop field rotation in the Mediterranean. Here is a picture of the open field system. There would be certain parts of it that would lie, lie furlough for um, a year to try to regenerate the nutrients while different kinds of crops were planted in different parts of the land that would use different nutrients. Villages maintained open meadows for hay and natural pasture for animals. Peasants were often taxed very heavily. Peasants in Eastern Europe were far worse off than peasants in Western Europe, however. In the 18th century, in England, the Netherlands, and France, they became leaders for increased agriculture and industry and trade that resulted in population growth. Features of the Agricultural Revolution Increased crop and animal yields, meaning how much crop is brought forth and how many animals are um, born, uh, could feed more people. New methods of cultivation came about as well. Crops were now grown on reclaimed wastelands and uncultivated common lands, like the draining of swamps. Those were reclaimed wastelands. And of course, uncultivated common lands are the pasture lands that had existed throughout the medieval period. Selective breeding of livestock led to better cultivation as a result of healthier animals. Science and technology was now being applied to agriculture. In the Low Countries, like the Netherlands, they led the way in this new kind of agriculture. The increased population in the Low Countries meant that finding new methods of agriculture became paramount. The growth of towns and cities created major markets for food produced in the countryside. Regional specialization in the Netherlands resulted. Certain areas were used for farming certain regions for fishing and shipping, and towns and cities for mercantile activities. That's what we mean by regional specialization. Certain regions were uh, used for certain kinds of business or farming or fishing. By the mid 17th century, the Dutch enclosed fields, rotated crops, 
employed heavy use of manure for fertilizer and planted a wide variety of crops. Free and capitalistic society gave profit incentives for farmers to be increasingly productive. Drainage was another big part of the Low Countries when it came to agricultural revolution. Much of Holland or the Low Countries had once been marshland or even covered by the ocean. The Dutch led the world in reclaiming wetlands through drainage. Cornelius Vermuden was the most famous of the Dutch engineers in drainage techniques. Later, this was used extensively in southern England to create new farmlands as well. And by the way, folks, we have done the same kind of thing here in Jacksonville, Florida, um, dredging up um, uh, places over where the shipyards are to create more land uh, that we can use for the shipyards. England. By 1870, crop yields had tripled since 1700, with only a 14 increase in people working the land. That's a significant increase. Crop rotation was pioneered by the Viscount Charles Townsend. Viscount is a title of coat, just so you know, his first name is Charles, last name is Townsend. As England's ambassador to the Netherlands, he witnessed Dutch use of nitrogen-rich crops, such as turnips and clover, they planted these alongside the other crops to replenish the soil so that fallowing was not necessary, meaning letting a part of the um, entire crop have nothing planted on it for a year lying fallow was no longer necessary because the nitrogen rich crops could replenish the soil so it could remain under use constantly. He later also drained much land back home in England to reclaim it and make more territory to farm. He employed crop rotation, as I said before, turnips, peas, beans, clover, and potatoes that all use different kinds of nutrients in the soil. Some nicknamed him Turnip Townsend because of the dependence on the turnip uh, to restore the nitrogen to the land. Enriched soil ended up providing more food for livestock and then ultimately that livestock would provide more food for people as well. Manure was used for fertilizer as well. They determined that the waste from the livestock could be used to help replenish the soil of the nutrients needed, especially nitrogen. Increased food for livestock meant mass slaughter of animals was no longer needed prior to winter because they couldn't feed them during the winter months. By 1740, new agricultural techniques had become popular among much of the English aristocracy. Below you see pictured Viscount Charles Townsend who brought Dutch agricultural techniques to England. Jethro Tull is another one. Jethro Tull lived from 1674 to 1741. His innovation is an example of how the empiricism of the scientific revolution was applied to agriculture. Remember, empiricism came from Bacon. It's the collecting of data uh, and experimentation with that data. He eventually developed a seed drill in 1701. The seed drill allowed for the sowing of crops in a straight row rather than scattering it by hand. And below you see a picture of a seed drill. He used horses for plowing rather than slower oxen as well. They could pull the seed drill and plant the seeds far more quickly than the oxen could pull the plow. 
The seed drill was later developed on a much larger scale to seed multiple rows simultaneously, as pictured above. Robert Bakewell, 1725 to 1795, pioneered selective breeding of livestock in England. Larger and healthier animals were developed as a result of selective breeding. More meat, wool, milk, leather, soap, and candle tallow also came from this as byproducts of those healthier animals. More manure also became available for fertilizing. You have more and larger animals, they produce more waste. That manure then can be used to help fertilize the crops and yield more crops. It is a cycle Key concepts. Key concept. New foods. Remember back to the chapter, um, the unit one, uh, when we talked about the Columbian Exchange as a byproduct of the Age of Exploration. Well, we're now going to talk a little bit more about what came about in Europe as a result of that. The Columbian Exchange resulted in a revolution in diet. For Europeans. New foods from the New World became increasingly available in the 17th and 18th centuries. Potatoes and corn were among the most important because both were highly nutritious, highly caloric, and easy to grow. The Enclosure Movement in England the first enclosure, meaning enclosing of the common lands to bring them under production rather than allowing them to remain open for pasture, the first enclosure had begun in, way back in the 16th century, in the 1500s. Landowners sought to increase profits from wool production by enclosing the fields for raising sheep. We brought this up a few units ago. It differed from 18th century enclosure that is now happening that were based largely on agriculture. The enclosure of fields intensified in the 18th century, especially in England. The practice effectively ended the open field system on common lands. Landowners instead consolidated their scattered holdings into compact fields that were fenced in. Common pasture lands were also enclosed. Wealthy landowners, like the gentry, enjoyed freehold tenure, which meant the ownership and control of lands indefinitely. This resulted in the commercialization of agriculture. This is when agriculture became a big business, the food business, like, for example, we have ConAgra today. Large landowner, landowners prospered and invested in technology, machinery, breeding, cultivation methods, etc. And this would allow them to increase in number of large and medium-sized farms to bring more land out of production and produce more food. Parliament in England passed over 3,000 enclosure acts in the late 18th century and the early 19th century that benefited the large landowners. As we will discuss, one of the reasons why these uh, acts are being passed is by this point those wealthy landowners are the ones that are participating in the electoral system. They are the ones electing parliament members to the House of Commons who are going to pass laws that will benefit them. Here um, are some um, illustrations, maps from Appleby, England before and after the enclosure. Before you can see the um, open portions of the fields that don't have anything planted on them. And then after, of course, you see where it's all brought under production and enclosed. 
the Corn Laws uh, were passed in 1815 by Parliament and they ultimately benefited landowners. The Corn Laws initiated high tariffs or taxes on foreign grain in order to make sure that the British farmers could receive the highest price for their foodstuffs. If you don't import grain, you don't have the market being flooded with more grain um, and ultimately that means you can charge more for the grain that you are producing. By the way, I'm saying grain because the corn laws actually were not just for corn, they were also for all grain products. This will drive up the price of English grain in England, like I said. And this hurt the poor as they couldn't afford price increases for food, but it benefited those landowners. And they were the ones electing the people to the Parliament's House of Commons. So they were passing laws that would benefit others that were just like them. The Corn Laws were one of the most notorious examples of a law that benefited the wealthy at the expense of the English peasantry. Enclosures impact on the peasantry. Well, many were forced off lands that had been common lands before that they were able to use. Many will end up having to abandon their lifestyle of agriculture and move into the towns or cities looking for work as work on the farmlands was less available in the countryside. Many found work in factories or joined workhouses or even poorhouses. At this point, the majority of the factories were still in their infancy. We don't have wide scale factories with big ginormous machines at this point, but they are coming. Many became impoverished farm laborers on large farms, almost like what happened in the United States after the American Civil War with the sharecropping. In some cases, enclosure freed men to pursue other economic opportunities, such as the cottage industry, the early uh, industrial um, production. We'll talk more about that. We talked about it a little bit in a previous unit. We'll talk more about that soon here as well. Women now had no way to raise animals on common lands for extra money. Back throughout the medieval period, women were sometimes in charge of raising um, the sheep uh, or the goats for cheese. Uh, and they now no longer had a way to do that because they didn't have the common lands that they could um, use to pasture their animals. Impact on women as a result. In traditional communities, women had been an indispensable part of a household's economic survival since the medieval period. Women farmed, raised animals, and oversaw important functions of the household. The enclosure of common lands meant that women and men were both forced off of those common lands. Economic opportunities for women thus decreased significantly. Now it's not like these women before were acting in their own economic interest, but they were doing it for their family. It was a part of the family unit and the ability of the family to survive and feed themselves. And now that's taken away. Many families with daughters were eager to get them out of the house as now, as they were an extra mouth to feed. Young women increasingly went into towns and cities or were sent there by their families where they became domestic workers in wealthy people's homes or in many cases where there were no other alternatives, they became prostitutes. Families who were able to get by in the countryside often supplemented their income through the cottage industry or the putting out system. We talked about this in a previous unit with the price revolution. This was mostly for spinning and weaving in the textile or cloth industry. Women played an important role in spinning and weaving. A strict hierarchical society emerged as a result of these changes. 
there were a few large landowners, nobles and gentry, that dominated the economy and politics through the House of Commons. A few strong, prosperous tenant farmers would rent land as well. Some small, independent peasant farmers owned land. But a large mass of landless peasants now worked as wage workers either on farms or as cottagers in the cottage industry. Key concept. Struggles between landlords and peasants occurred as a result of this. Game laws, meaning laws passed um, by landowners, um, not allowing anyone to hunt on their lands. Um, that these game laws were passed on behalf of those landowners whereby any animals on the owner's vast lands were not allowed to be hunted for food unless it was done by the owner himself. Peasants who were without food would risk severe punishment if they were caught hunting for food on an owner's land, even if they went into the woods to kill a rabbit to feed their family. They could be severely punished. Revolts sometimes broke out in response to these increasingly oppressive conditions for the landless peasants. Enclosure did not spread significantly beyond Western Europe, however. France did not develop enclosure as a national policy, and after the 1760s, peasants in the provinces strongly opposed enclosure. Eastern Europe did not see fundamental agricultural changes until the 19th century. The Impact of the Agricultural Revolution First of all, it led to Europe's population explosion in the 18th century. Enclosure also altered rural society, or the countryside living, forever. Common lands, as I said, were enclosed. Widespread migration to towns and cities led to increased urbanization, or people moving into the cities and that becoming more of a lifestyle. Women were adversely affected, as we said. The cottage industry will emerge as a means of supplementing a farm family's income. And economically, the increased supply of food resulted in lower food prices overall that enabled people to spend more money on consumer goods. Now, this factor will actually not be a big um, movement until later on after more um, folks start participating in the um, mechanized industry of the Industrial Revolution, but we will see that as time goes along. Right now in England, um, at this point in the early, um, in late 18th century, early 19th century, the corn laws were still in effect that kept the food prices artificially high um, to benefit the landowners. That will change as time goes on. By the middle of the 1800s, um, the, those laws will be lifted largely because of the Irish potato famine and the massive influx of Irish coming into England proper and that will result in the farmers in England not being able to keep up with the demand for foodstuffs. We'll talk more about that later. Key concept. Population explosion. Limits on population growth existed prior to 1700. Famine, disease, and warfare all kept the population growth in check during that century. Also, the Little Ice Age during the late 16th and early 17th centuries imposed limits on agricultural production. Not until the mid 16th century did Europe's population reach pre-Black Death levels in the early 1300s. Key concept. Causes for population growth after 1700. The agricultural revolution that we just discussed made more food available to larger populations. 
new foods such as the potato coming from the New World that could easily be planted in Europe became a stable crop for the poor in many countries, like Ireland that I mentioned before. Improved food transportation also was due to better roads and canals, so you could get foodstuffs from place to place more quickly before it spoiled. Better diets resulted in stronger immune systems and people were able to fight off disease. Again, those new foodstuffs like the potato that were highly caloric and full of nutrients aided in that as well. The disappearance of the bubonic plague occurred after the 1660s as well. Improved sanitation in towns and cities was also something that will uh, help. Now, improvement is a relative term. It was pretty bad still, um, as we will discuss as we move into the mechanized industrial revolution in a later unit. The 18th century wars were also less destructive than the 17th century wars. Advances in medicine were not yet a significant cause of the population growth. Not yet, but they will be in the next century. Population growth had reached a plateau between 1650 and 1750. A plateau means that there wasn't a lot of uh, growth, there wasn't a lot of decline, it pretty much leveled off. But population growth began to grow dramatically after 1750. Between 1700 and 1800, the European population increased from about 120 million people to about 190 million people, an increase in about 70 million people. That's a lot. Concept. Proto-industrialization, the cottage industry or the putting out system. We discussed a little bit of this in an earlier unit, but now we're going to discuss it in a little more detail. Rural industry became a major pillar of Europe's growing economy in the late 18th century. The rural or farming, or I guess I should say countryside living population was eager to supplement its income as the fields were being enclosed by the wealthy landowners. They needed to find other means to support their families. Merchant capitalists in the cities were eager to draw on the cheap labor in the countryside in these cottages, rather than paying guild members higher fees to produce the goods. Thus, early industrialism was put out into the countryside, into the cottage industry, hence the putting out system. Manufacturing with hand tools in peasant cottages came to challenge urban craft industry. Cottage industry. Merchant capitalists provided the raw materials. We're going to use an example of textiles in England, okay, or cloth. Uh, raw wool would be a raw material or even raw cotton um, to an extent. Um, they would uh, provide the raw materials to a rural family who would then produce a finished or semi-finished product and sent it back to the merchant for payment. They would get paid a wage for their trouble. Cottage workers were usually paid by the number of pieces they produced. Sometimes this was known as piecework. Merchants would sell the finished product for a profit that, of course, would go far beyond what they were willing to pay the cottage worker. Wool cloth was the most important product in England in the 1700s. The cottage industry was essentially a family enterprise. The work of four or five spinners was needed to keep one weaver steadily employed. You would take the raw wool and spin it into thread. Then you would take the thread and weave it into cloth. The husband and wife 
constantly tried to find more thread and spinners in order to um, get more wages for their family. Spinsters were widows and unmarried women who spun for their living. That's where that term came from. Sometimes families subcontracted work to others. Here is a picture of a typical cottage industry home with the father weaving on the right while his wife and daughter spin thread with spinning wheels on the left and the center. Now problems with the cottage industry. There would be constant disputes between the cottagers and the merchants over weights of materials and the quality of the cloth produced. Rural labor was unorganized and usually difficult for merchants to control. Merchant capitalists searched for more efficient methods of production and it became, that became a profound um, had a profound resulting in growth of factories in the Industrial Revolution by the time we get to the mid and late 1700s in England, a little bit later in other parts of Europe. Results? Thousands of poor rural families were now able to supplement their incomes and feed their families. Unregulated production, however, in the countryside resulted in experimentation and diversification of goods. It was hard to have quality control. Goods included textiles, knives and forks, housewares, buttons, production of gloves, clocks, and musical instruments. These were all very popular uh, products that were made through the cottage industry. The cottage industry flourished first in England. That's why we're using it as our example. But please know that it will uh, be done, done in other parts of Europe as well. It's just that England was first. Spinning and weaving of, wooden, of woolen cloth, excuse me, was most important, as we said before. In 1500, half of England's textiles were produced in the countryside. By 1700, the percentage was even higher. The putting out system in England later spread to continental countries like France and Germany. Proto-industrial technology, meaning prior to horsepower, water power, and the steam engine. In 1733, John Kay invented the flying shuttle which enabled a weaver to throw the shuttle back and forth on a loom between threads with one hand, and this allowed him to weave the cloth far more quickly than he could before. If you want to click on that video clip, you can see um, how the flying shuttle worked. In 1764, James Hargraves invented the spinning jenny which he named after his daughter. The spinning jenny mechanized the spinning wheel so that eight spools of thread could easily be spun simultaneously. Eventually, the spinning jenny will be expanded to create dozens of spools of thread at one time. Later improvements, as I said, were made to the spinning jenny that enabled the number of threads spun on a single machine to be increased to even 80. That means that one person can produce the same amount of thread um, that 80 people did with just a regular singular spinning wheel. That is a massive increase in production of thread. Now we need to develop some kind of weaving loom that can increase production to keep up. Mercantilism and the Atlantic trading system. European maritime, ex maritime or naval expansion in the 18th century. World trade became fundamental to the European economy by this point because of the overseas empires of the nations in Europe. Sugar became the most important commodity produced in the Atlantic trade. 
Tobacco, cotton, and indigo were also important. The slave trade was enormous at this point. Spain and Portugal revitalized their empires and grew economically from renewed development. The Netherlands, Great Britain, and France, however, benefited the most. By far, England had the largest number of immigrants to the New World at this time. They were settling mostly along the coastline of North America into colonies. Characteristics of mercantilism. Let's review just a little bit here. The main goal, remember, was economic self-sufficiency of a nation. A country or empire sought to create a favorable, quote, balance of trade, end quote, by exporting more than it imported. Tariffs or customs duties were placed on imports. Bullionism um, was another part of this as well, where governments sought to build up large reserves of gold and silver and prevent the export of these precious metals out of their countries. Colonies were acquired, overseas colonies were acquired to provide raw materials and markets for the mother country. States granted monopolies to large companies like the British East India Company and the Dutch East India Company. States encouraged the development of domestic industries so that a country would not have to buy a finished product from a rival country. Again, this is all review of stuff that we have covered in past units. Key concept. Great Britain. Great Britain became the world's leading maritime power in the 18th century. The world's leading maritime, meaning naval power. The Bank of England in 1694, established in 1694, provided an important source of capital for economic development of the overseas empire. The Act of Union in 1707, as you recall, unified England and Scotland. The Scots sought the benefits of trade within the English empire. British mercantilism differed from France in that government economic regulations often served the private interest of individuals and groups as well as the public needs of the state. A little bit of a different flavor to British mercantilism. In contrast, authoritarian states like France sought an economic system that primarily benefited the state rather than the businessmen and workers. For example, the intendant system was extended throughout the French Empire. The Navigation Acts in England were passed by Parliament to increase military power and private wealth. The first of these Navigation Acts was passed in 1651, seeking to reduce Dutch domination of the Atlantic trade. It required most goods imported from Europe into Britain to be carried on British owned ships with British crews or on ships of the country producing that specific good. This gave British merchants and ship owners a virtual monopoly on trade with the colonies. It's pretty brilliant if you think about it. Key concept. The Dutch Republic. During the first half of the 17th century, the Netherlands was the world's dominant maritime power. This is why Great Britain wanted to change that. The Netherlands were known um, by this time as this was known as the golden age of the Netherlands, the first half of the 17th century. They will be eclipsed by England in the second half of the 17th century. The middle class, or burghers, as they were called, dominated politics and the economy in the Dutch Republic. The government remained decentralized and did not impede the economy, did not get involved in the economy. More free market. 
A large degree also of religious toleration enabled foreign merchants to live in the Dutch Republic without persecution. The three Anglo-Dutch wars between 1652 and 1674, however, damaged Dutch shipping and commerce and favored the English. New Amsterdam was seized by England in 1664. That was in North America and it was renamed New York. By late 17th century, the Dutch were falling behind England in shipping, trade, and in colonies overseas. However, the English and Dutch became allies eventually to stop the expansion of Louis XIV in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. The wars of Louis XIV further weakened Dutch trade in the Atlantic, however. The Netherlands shifted its attention to banking rather than trade and managed to survive intact. They were the first country to perfect the use of paper currency. The stock market in Amsterdam became the most important in Europe. A central bank was created. Key concept. The slave trade. The dramatic growth in the Atlantic trade of slaves was due in large part to the growth of slave labor. About 10 million Africans were transported to the New World in the 17th and 18th centuries, and the slave trade made up the bulk of the Atlantic trade that was going on. Half of the slave trade occurred on British ships, 25% on French ships. British and French governments gave chartered companies monopolies over the slave trade in the 17th and early 18th century. Forts, or factories, were set up on the West African coast to oversee and protect the slave trade. As many as 400,000 ended up in British North America in colonies such as Virginia, Maryland, and South Carolina. Independent slave traders broke the slave trade monopoly by the 1730s. The slave trade as part of the Atlantic trade actually started to dwindle significantly by the 1780s. Most of the subsequent increase in the New World slave population by that point came from natural population growth. The nutrition um, had increased so much that the slaves actually started producing their own children that survived infancy and therefore that's what we mean by natural population growth in the slave community. That is this, this is the end of part one of this lecture. Key concept. Key concept. Life in the 18th century. Marriage and family patterns prior to 1750 checked population growth. The nuclear family was the most common in pre-industrial Europe. Young married European couples established their homes apart from their parents. Three generation households usually entailed a parent moving in with a married child. On average, the age at marriage was higher prior to 1750, especially for the lower classes. Some areas required legal permission or approval of the local lord or landowner for marriage. Many men and women never married as a result prior to 1750. Approximately 40% to 60% of women between the age of 15 and 44 were unmarried at any given time. Children, the rate of births out of wedlock was fairly low due to social controls like shunning um, in the religious community. New patterns of marriage and legitimacy, however, emerged after 1750. Although the rate of illegitimate births increased in the 18th century, 
population growth was limited by the European marriage pattern and in some areas by the early practice of birth control. The growth of the cottage industry with its increased income resulted in higher rates of people marrying for love instead of just purely economic reasons. Young people did not have to wait as long to become financially independent anymore because of the cottage industry. Arranged marriages for economic reasons declined as a result. Laws and regulations on marriage, especially in Germany, were often ignored. Factory workers after 1780 followed marriage patterns of cottage workers. The explosion of births was caused by increasing illegitimacy between 1750 and 1850. Illegitimacy rates were as high as 33% in certain areas, so things started shifting once again. In Germany, illegitimate births were a result of open rebellion against class laws limiting marriage among the poor. Illegitimacy declined when marriage restrictions were rescinded. Women in cities and factories had limited economic independence. Young women were not motivated by visions of emancipation and sexual liberation. Most city women probably looked to marriage and family life as an escape from a hard working lifestyle. Many intended marriages did not take place as poor economic and social conditions scarred, scared sorry, <laughs> men away from the commitment. And maybe it scarred them too. Haha. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, key concept. Attitudes towards children began to change during the 18th century as well. As infant and child mortality decreased and commercial wealth increased, Families dedicated more space and resources to child rearing, as well as private life and comfort. Child care and nursing. Poorer women generally breastfed their infants for much longer periods than in the 20th century because it was cheaper than having to feed them other things. Women of the aristocracy and the upper middle class seldom breastfed, however. This was also true of wives of artisans who lived comfortably. They believed it was a crude, common practice that was beneath their dignity, so instead they hired wet nurses. Wet nurses were hired to breastfeed their children, and the idea was they would hire a woman who was already breastfeeding her small child to also breastfeed, the, breastfeed their child. Many babies were often sent to the countryside to live with wet nurses. Wet nursing took two to three years. Killing nurses, as they were sometimes called, were negligent wet nurses, and this resulted in the death of many or most babies in their custody. Not all wet nurses were killing nurses, but the ones that were referred to as killing nurses had a terrible reputation um, kind of like the midwives having a bad reputation um, as being witches uh, in earlier centuries. Infanticide was also a reality during this period. The early medieval church had denounced infanticide or the killing of infants. It was viewed um, they it was viewed as terrible because each human life was seen as sacred in the medieval church. Yet, infanticide was rampant due to severe poverty. People just couldn't afford to feed those infants. So, this resulted in things called overlaying, which occurred in many cases with a parent rolling over and suffocating a child in bed, sometimes on purpose because they couldn't afford to feed the child. It's a horrible thing. Foundling hospitals emerged first in Paris, then throughout Europe to try to deal with these unwanted infants. Many poor women left babies on the doorstep of churches and foundling homes. Some social critics claim that foundling hospitals promoted what was called legalized infanticide because so many died of the poor conditions that were in those foundling hospitals. 
sometimes there would be a 50 to 90 percent mortality rate in these places. They were horrible. Child rearing also was different than we have seen in previous centuries. Children were often treated indifferently and with strict physical discipline. The use of wet nurses is a good example of this. Because of such high mortality rates, parents were reluctant to become too emotionally attached to their children. Doctors often declined to care for sick children, believing there was little that could be done. Spare the rod and spoil the child was a term coined by the novelist Daniel Defoe. Many children worked in factories at a young age and were severely disciplined. Many believed the task of parents was to break the will of children and to make them obedient. Humanitarianism and the Enlightenment optimism regarding human progress emphasized better treatment of children as we moved forward. Rousseau encouraged greater love and understanding toward children. Increasingly, parents grew closer to their children. Key concept. Work away from home. Many young people worked within their families until they could start their own households. Cottage industry, as stated earlier, allowed them to do that. Increasingly, many boys worked away from home. Boys in towns might be apprenticed to a craftsman for seven or even 14 years to learn a trade and be admitted into a guild. This still happens in some industries like the electrician industry. They were not allowed to marry during this period. Well, that's not so much a practice anymore, but still. <clears throat> More often, young men would drift from one tough job to another. Large numbers of girls also worked away from home at an early age. Opportunities were more limited than for men. Domestic service in another family's household was the most common job. If any of you have ever seen or read Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, you can note that the Cratchit family had an older daughter that they had basically farmed out to be a domestic servant for another family. And she comes home Christmas Day after completing her chores at the other family's home. Most hope to save their money, um, save money for their parents and for marriage. Working away benefited the parents also who had one less mouth to feed. Servant girls, however, had very little independence and were often abused. Girls were vulnerable to physical mistreatment by their mistresses. Upper classes also exploited them sexually, oftentimes. Pregnant girls were quickly fired. Prostitution and petty thievery often became the only alternatives. Key concept. The rise in prosperity produced advances in material well-being. Greater prosperity was associated with increased literacy, education, and rich cultural lives. By the end of the 18th century, a high proportion of Europeans were better fed, healthier, longer lived, and more secure and comfortable in their material well-being. This relative prosperity was balanced by increasing numbers of the poor throughout Europe. Key concept. Education. The beginnings of formal education for the masses took root, largely inspired by Protestantism. The aristocracy and rich had a two-century head start beginning in the 16th century with special colleges often run by Jesuits. Little schools of elementary education began to appear in the 17th century. Boys and girls from age 7 to 12 were instructed in basic literacy and religion. The Church of England and dissenting groups such as the Puritans founded charity schools to instruct poor children. Scotland created a network of parish schools for all citizens to teach reading of the scriptures. 
France established Christian schools starting in 1682, which taught religion as well as reading and writing. Starting in 1717, Prussia led the way with universal compulsory education. This trend was inspired by the old Protestant idea that every Christian should be able to read the Bible. Education could be used to make the population effectively serve the state as well through newspapers and um, propaganda that the governments could put out. The Enlightenment commitment to greater knowledge through critical thinking reinforced interest in education during the 18th century. Literacy by 1800. Almost 90% of the Scottish male population, only one in six in 1600, could read. Two thirds of males in France, in Normandy, 90%. Only one sixth in 1600. Over 50% of male Brits, only 25% in 1600. So it increased dramatically. Women were increasingly literate as well, but still lagged behind men in general. Key concept Increased life expectancy as a byproduct of this. The average lifespans of Europeans increased from 25 to 35 years in the 18th century. This was largely re the result of the disappearance of the plague and the disappearance of starvation due to the agricultural revolution. More time was spent by children on education and preparation for adulthood as a byproduct. The development of public health techniques were an important breakthrough of the second half of the 18th century. Improved practices in sanitation were immensely useful. Mass vaccinations even. Better clothing due to proto-industrialization. Improvements in developing warm, dry housing. Adequate food due to the agricultural revolution. Diet and nutrition underwent significant changes during the 18th century. The diet of ordinary people improved. Poor people's diets usually consisted of grains and vegetables. The potato improved the diet of the poor with vitamins A and C. Most Irish lived almost exclusively on the potato as a result. They lived in abject poverty, but the potato helped them survive. By the end of the 18th century, the potato was an important food in much of Europe. A greater variety of vegetables existed in towns and cities. The upper classes consumed much meat and fish and alcohol. Few fruits and vegetables were eaten by the upper class because that was seen as lower class food. Greater affluence or wealth meant some people indulged in less nutritious food, including sugary foods. So here they are eating meat and sugar. So you can guess what that's going to do to the health of the upper classes. Northern Atlantic Europe ate better than Southern Mediterranean Europe, however. The English ate the best of all because of the agricultural revolution that took place there. Key concept. Medical improvements. The plague had largely disappeared from Europe by the 17th century. The conquest of smallpox as a disease was the greatest medical triumph of the 18th century. In the 17th century, 25% of deaths in Great Britain were caused by smallpox. Smallpox killed perhaps 60 million people in the 18th century. 400,000 per year on average. 80% of Europeans contracted it. Many were scarred for life if it didn't kill them. Lady Mary Wortley Montagu introduced a Turkish technique of vaccination in the 18th century, but it was roundly criticized, largely because it was dangerous and, of course, because she was a woman suggesting it. 
Edward Jenner, however, between 1749 and 1823 are his lifespan. Uh, in 1778, he created the foundation for the science of immunology with his vaccine for smallpox. He discovered inoculating patients with cowpox would control the onset of smallpox. Cowpox was a disease that was in cows, but it was similar to smallpox. And so he discovered that if he inoculated patients with the cowpox disease, it would eventually help them fend off the smallpox. Humanitarianism of the late 18th century led also to hospital reform. Ventilation improved and filth eliminated as disease believed to be caused by bad air. Well, we all know that uh, clean linens helps, um, especially in hospitals, uh, as well as ventilation. The spread of infection was reduced as a result. The first humane mental hospital was founded in England in 1790. Humane meaning not just an institution or prison, but real care for the mental, mentally ill. The arts in the 18th century. First of all, we have neoclassicism in the visual arts. This is reflected in the new enlightenment ideals of political um, changes in citizenship that go along with the late 18th century and early 19th centuries. We'll talk more specifically about these as we move into the age of revolutions. Characteristics. There was a seeking to return to the artistic style of ancient Rome, Greek ideals, and the Renaissance once again. Simplicity, balance, symmetry, and restraint were the basic characteristics. probably one of the most famous from the neoclassical period uh, in terms of visual artists, was Jacques-Louis David. He lived from 1748 to 1825, and he's one of the most important artists of the movement. He's often referred to as the French Revolution artist. Probably his most famous work is The Death of Socrates in 1787. It's seen as perhaps the first major work of this movement. He painted numerous works that glorified the French Revolution. After 1800, David developed his empire style that in part glorified Napoleon's regime. We'll see a few paintings as follows. He became Napoleon's official court, court painter after his coronation in 1804. We'll discuss this more when we talk about Napoleon. Here's the most famous piece from Jacques-Louis David, The Death of Socrates. It shows Socrates the moment before he drinks the hemlock poison, and it shows Plato at his side, looking up at him with despair on his face. Neoclassical architecture became popular in many public buildings as well as private residences. Probably one of the most famous pieces of neoclassical architecture is the Arc de Triomphe, which is now located in Paris. Though planning began in 1806 to commemorate Napoleon's triumphs, the Arc de Triomphe was not fully completed until the mid-1830s after Napoleon's defeat. It stands at the western end of the Champs-Élysées still to this day. Washington, D.C., as America is forming a new nation, uh, will see numerous buildings created in this empire style. If you go to Washington, D.C. today, you can still see evidence of these buildings all around you. The White House, the Capitol, the monuments. Music was probably where the biggest superstars of the era came from in the classical style. The neoclassical ideas in the visual arts influenced music as well as the ideals of balance, symmetry, and restraint. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who lived from 1756 to 1791, 
Franz Joseph Haydn, 1732 to 1809, and Ludwig von Beethoven, 1770 to 1826, became masters of this new style. And if it had not been for the Viennese royal court in Austria, the Empire of Austria, perhaps no one would know who these men were. Thanks to Joseph II and his successors, many of these musicians would be patronized. The classical era moved away from the dense Baroque textures of J.S. Bach and Handel that we listened to in a previous mix. Instead, it focused on simple, tuneful melodies and clearer forms emerged. The symphony developed as an important genre. If you would like, there are clips that you can click on and listen to. Excerpts from Mozart's A Little Night Music or Einen Kleinen Nacht Music, Haydn's Surprise Symphony, Symphony Number no. 94, and Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5, The First Movement.